uh, first of all, I, I would like to say that it's indeed a very good choice uh, to begin this conference uh, with you talk, uh, because you gave a, a lot of clues uh, about what is at stake in this uh, field of deliberation, I think so. Well, you, uh, with the others, uh, I would say that you introduce another turn inside the deliberative turn, I would say. Uh, maybe we, we could say that uh, you introduce a sort of democratic turn inside uh, the deliberative turn, the so-called deliberative uh, turn. So what is it, this, uh, this turn inside the turn? Uh, well, I think this inflection deals uh, with the loosening, loosening of deliberative norms and the scaling up of deliberative design. This is the two changes of these new turns. Um, in you, uh, you redefine conception, you and others, redefine conception of deliberation. Well, in this new uh, definition, deliberation is not merely based on reasons, exchange, but could involve a mixture of reasons, emotion, and self-interest. You say that. You redefine conception of deliberation, uh, include also uh, a change in the outcomes of deliberation. Deliberation is not necessarily, not, is, is, does not necessarily lead to agreement or consensus, but to clarification of interests and to clarification of conflict. And this can emerge from, uh, from deliberation. Well, this turn also impl implies a change of scale, a scaling up of deliberative design. From now on, deliberation is not confined to many publics or institutional and formal <laughs> settings, while deliberation overflows in the, in the entire public <laughs> sphere, including lay citizens and activists. We could say micro-deliberation is, ch is challenged by macro-deliberation as Carolina Andrews puts it. Then specialists need imperatively to address the question of dissemination of deliberation and also the issue of connection between various channels through where the dynamics of deliberation goes. Well, I will just launch the discussion because we need time to, to have a very, very lively discussion and I will have a Four questions, four main questions. Well, my first question is very large, but I think it is worth to address this question in the beginning of this conference. You argue in favor of an expanded conception of deliberation. According to you, if you take a reflective stand, what are the gains and the losses of such an expansion? Obvio obviously, the gains can be found in the fact that you bring back deliberation to the real world, to social reality. But sometimes one can get the impression that everything is deliberation, except coercion. I will, I will say very bluntly, ex except for Strauss-Kahn and possibly Afghanistan, everything can fit with deliberation. Except what? From sports fan and maybe possibly sports Afghanistan, fan. everything could you be. You said sports fan. Sports fan. Sports fan. I'm going to get why. I, mean, I, mean, I missed something. I don't know why. Sports fan. Sports fan. Sports fan. Sports fan. Because you told me that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, let me just talk okay, here. Ex yeah, except for the star <laughs> and Afghanistan. And possibly Afghanistan. Everything could fit with, uh, with deliberation. So my point is, according to you, if you say, well, what are the gain and losses we have? And I think it's worth to, to ask, to address this question at this conference. Well, my second question deals with the famous notion of binding decision and of decision. You have a, you have a, uh, say something about that. Well, if, if I, I have understood rightly what you say, uh, in your 1999 paper, Every talk in the deliberative, every day talk in the deliberative system, you stress the link between two types of discussions. On the one hand, a discussion leading to binding decision, 
and on the other hand, discussion which are not implying binding decision. I think in, the, in your talk today, you introduced another distinction between state-oriented decision and society, society-oriented decision. But my question is when, for instance, when you, you, you talk about male chauvinism, it's not, it's not really a decision. You cannot say it's not really a decision. It's maybe ideas, perception, typification, whatever you call it. But what it has to take is not really a decision, I think, so when you say. And I think I would like to, 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 to understand uh, more clearly. I would like to understand more clearly the connection you make between the form opinion formation and will formation. Mm -hmm. uh, the connection between both of them. Well, thirdly, I have a question well, about uh, your notion of deliberative system. Well, I agree with you. Uh, the systemic approach is very, very convincing. But when I look at the map on, of the deliberative system, I think that you are referring to the anti-political system. So uh, the issue is less to set up a deliberative system as such, but to introduce more deliberative dynamics in a very composed and mixed political systems. And maybe that's quite different because the main question is how introducing deliberative dynamics and maybe know how to set up a system. And uh, for instance, are you in favor of designing everywhere within the political system some deliberative formal venues, groups, even small ones? And then which ones? Mixed groups, gathering experts and lay citizens, for instance, groups, uh, built on representation or participation, as Bernard uh, said uh, in the beginning of the, of the morning. So concretely, what types of design and formal design are you favoring? Uh, you can say also, are you in favor of promoting deliberative actors, not design, not institutional and formal design, but to to change or to, to the actors and to promote deliberative actors. In this case, what is at stake is socialization, maybe training, maybe formation, maybe school socialization. So I would like to, to know, you will answer both, both of them, <laughs> but uh, I would like to, to hear you about that. Uh, finally, I have a question about deliberative standards. Uh, you sort out among the classic ones and you emphasize the importance of no coercion, equal opportunity of access, access to political influence and respect. In my empirical work, and I, I'm working on, on uh, everyday life discussion, uh, I would say that three elements or maybe three stages are very important. The first one, is only to express oneself. And a lot of people do not ex express themselves. You know, that's in survey and everywhere. So the first stage for deliberative dynamics is to express oneself. The second one, and you emphasize this point, uh, is to justify oneself, to refer your opinion to what you call consideration. Uh, it's not just a, a reason-oriented uh, argument, but it's consideration. And I think there is a, a third stage in, in the process and the dynamic of deliberation. It's to be able to take the other side, not just, just to move, just for a time for the exchange, uh, but to move from your location, your so social and political location, or to change your perspective, as Kramer Walsh puts it. And you didn't speak about this third stage, and I think it's uh, the, uh, the core, maybe, of uh, uh, deliberation dynamics. So I would like to, to, to ask you, would you agree with this type of classification? 
Well, once again, I, I would like to thank uh, you on be, uh, behalf of all the organizers for this challenging introduction. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, so, uh, the, the, what are the losses? Can everything be a deliberation? The, uh, the, uh, okay, yeah. My, my uh, use of common concerns was intended, and the two examples of a beauty contest and jazz were intended to try to draw the line between what we would consider um, within the deliberative system on common issues of common concern and not binding uh, decisions um, does a binding decision and a, um, and a non-binding decision, as in my first article, correspond with state and society? Es essentially, yes. What I was trying to say today is there can be binding decisions within society. That was the point of the Mackey um, genital cutting example. That was a binding decision. And the, they had the people who made the decision not to cut their daughters and to not let their sons Mary cut women were obligated morally. They were not obligated politically, but they were obligated morally after promising that they would publicly that they would do this. So it was binding on them, but it was not binding through the state. So the binding, non-binding distinction does not map entirely onto the state society distinction, but it, uh, there's a great deal of overlap because the key thing about the state is the binding quality of its decisions and the fact that it can then enforce those decisions with the state's legitimate monopoly of force, which is not true of, let's say, the cutting uh, example. Um, so um, so those, those two overlap fairly greatly. Um, would I be in favor of designing formal venues everywhere? Um, no, because I, I want to be able to sleep and um, go, go to, you know, as, as Oscar Wilde said, socialism takes too many evenings and so does deliberation. Uh, so we don't want uh, these things everywhere, but more of them? Yes, I'm for more of them, presuming that they're not too expensive. Um, and uh, which ones? Mick? all sorts of ones. We are really only on the frontier, as, as Bernard introduced, saying we've, we're beginning a large number of pathways in this, uh, in this endeavor. We're just on the frontier of understanding what kinds of institutions we can invent that will do what jobs. And um, so it, it's exciting what kinds of things can come down the path. Within these little uh, institutions, there will be informal representation. And conceptually, I think this is a, uh, a major uh, point. Laura Montanaro uh, had a panel on informal representation in the American Political Science Association a couple of years ago and is writing on it. Several other people are writing on informal representation. The way an NGO will informally represent, um, let's say, starving people in Africa even, uh, or a mini public uh, will informally represent citizens. We need to develop this normative criteria for those kinds of informal representation better than we have. So we can say, this isn't a very good example of informal representation. That one is. So if, as we have more of these, um, and inclusion, yes, I think the key, a key issue is subjugated knowledge, actually. I didn't have time to talk about that. So I would be very much uh, in favor of institutions that promote inclusion. As for, um, the deliberative standards, um, uh, um, I, I can't go into them at the moment, but let's take these just quickly, your, your stages. Express yourself, the first stage. That is not always deliberative. To the, from the perspective of um, the deliberative system, expressing yourself is deliberative only if somebody hears it. Um, Jeffrey Brennan had a wonderful example of expression when he said, when you're, you see your team on the television, you cheer, you know, some, not everybody, but some people, cheer them on, even if you're just there with your television in your living room all alone. That's expression, but I don't think it contributes to the deliberative process uh, very much, but it does a great deal for you. Um, it makes your testosterone rise if you're male and all sorts of things. Um, but uh, it's, it's not part of the deliberative system. So second, justifying yourself. Obviously, that is very much part of the deliberative system. And finally, taking the other side. In any individual instance of deliberation, taking the other side is crucial. 
uh, it's part of what we mean by mutual respect and accommodation. It is the center of mutual respect and accommodation. I try to understand what you're meaning, and I try to assimilate it, I try to respond. In the deliberative system as a whole, however, um, sometimes, and this was, has, has been one of my sort of leitmotifs, there are places that don't listen. There are places that don't take the other side, and yet they can play an important role in the deliberative system. Uh, yes, Jan Elster, Collège de France, uh, Columbia University. Uh, I have four quick comments uh, to this very interesting uh, talk. Uh, first, about the notion of a system. Uh, systems sometimes are said to evolve, sometimes they are made. In this case, the system seems to be simply uh, uh, arising from decentralized accidents. Uh, there is no particular way in which any one agent could act on the system to improve it. If it works fine, that's good. If it doesn't, well, that's just too bad. I'm not sure system uh, is appropriate for, uh, for this um, uh, agglomeration of uh, decentralized uh, uh, decision-making systems. Second comment, to the extent that decisions uh, are distributed Th more diffusely throughout the social and political system, doesn't that dilute responsibility and accountability? And isn't doesn't that, that doesn't that dilute responsibility and accountability? To, to, the, to the extent that, that decision making is is yes yes, yes. oh absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. and isn't yeah, that yeah, isn't that right. an issue you want to address? Uh, third, uh, third uh, concerning the egalitarian aspect of the standards. You said uh, in your talk that uh, wealth should not be given an undue impact on decisions, but wouldn't equality also require, as Rawls does, uh, some kind of minimal income level for people to be able to participate? In other words, how much does your um, deliberative equality imply uh, economic equality, not just a ceiling on high incomes? And last comment really picks up on what Florence Egel said in her uh, heard comments. It has to do with uh, both with the distinction between opinion formation and will formation and with the standards. In my opinion, one might add a fourth stage to Florence Gale's three stages, namely the stage in which uh, deliberation leads to decisions. And I think decision, deliberation without decision, uh, uh, is lacks discipline and focus. Uh, in a way that makes the effects not necessarily very useful. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for those, those linked comments. Um, let me take your last one first about decisions because it's related to accountability um, and responsibility and also related to the evolving aspect of this, of, us, of a system. Um, I think, um, I toyed with the idea of dispensing with decision in the societal realm. Uh, we, we understand what a decision is in the state realm. Uh, there is some, even if it's made administratively and even if agency A makes one decision, agency B makes another decision and they eventually they compromise out, we can, can often actually pinpoint the place where the scissors cut. Um, whereas in emerging uh, situation, we cannot necessarily call it a decision. Um, and there is, as you say, no sp specific focus in such an emergent process. But it's not as if the controversies in that process themselves have no focus. So for example, when a woman, and a woman calls her husband a male chauvinist and her husband says, no, I'm not a male chauvinist, and uh, she says, yes, you are, and he says, no. Then they begin to try to work out what it is, he said, and this comes from one of my interviews, that made her think he was a male chauvinist. When they sp specify that, he said, oh, I didn't realize I was doing that, and I'll try to stop. And she says to me with great satisfaction in the interview, he is better now. Now, that's, uh, that was an upper middle class uh, woman, and that almost, almost all my interviews were with uh, low-income women. 
Um, but low-income women report something similar, although not quite as discursive, in which um, decisions were made within their household. Uh, for example, the decision for the, of the woman not to cook dinner and so forth, and the decision of the husband not to leave her uh, when that happened. Um, and those, micro, those very tiny micro decisions add up to changes in larger social norms. So that we cannot say in the, in the social norms that at any moment a decision has been made that a certain kind of behavior is no longer appropriate. But um, I, one of my respondents said to her boss, you can't do that. This isn't the 60s. And she meant a decision had been made. This, this larger phenomenon was now itself taking a causal role vis-a-vis -vis the interaction between her and her boss. So I agree with you, it's better when you can have a focus, but it's not that there are no foci, they are just micro foci with micro decisions that then add up to some, in some way, to a, uh, in this emergent way to a larger decision. So however, uh, the accountability and responsibility is very diluted in a system. And we, ha that's a problem in the real world. There are many times in which we look out in the real world and we can't put precise uh, accountability or responsibility on someone. Now, I think it is best when states organize themselves in such a way that um, responsibility is more pinpointable and accountability is there, then citizens can therefore demand um, more accountability. For example, many layers of states or for example in the international context in the EU, many different agencies uh, may, helping make a decision makes it very difficult to pinpoint that accountability. So I would agree that on the state realm, it's quite important to pinpoint this responsibility when you can. But that's a, you, you lose things when in, in that process as well as gaining them. And what you lose is sometimes the free flow of discursive interaction that produces good decisions. Okay. Uh, no, oh, there's no, t yikes. Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll um, uh, yes, minimum income, important. Luigi <laughs> Bobbio. Luigi Bobbio, uh, University of Turin, Italy. Um, you made uh, many examples uh, of uh, micro venues which are not particularly deliberative, but their, their effect on the system are, uh, well, to, in to increase deliberation. But uh, there are many examples the other way around. I mean, uh, deliberative venues, micro venues, which have, uh, uh, micro which are, yes, yes. yeah, in embedded is in a non-deliberative system. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, they have no effect. Mm -hmm. And I think my experience is mostly of this case. So um, at, at the end, how can you distinguish between a deliberative system and a not deliberative system? Quickly. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to, to, dis to uh, map effect. Um, uh, Riker once um, tried to define power. Um, I think Nagel did the best job of defining power um, as uh, the uh, preferences or, in, or I would add interests of A affecting the uh, outcome. But cause is critical that, to that understanding of power. And we can't measure cause. You pointed it out long ago. You can only infer cause. So, um, and that's a problem with political science. Economic, economics have, has money as its entity. It can measure money. We have power as our entity. We can't measure power. We can only infer power. So in effect, um, you, you make the claim that these micro publics had no effect. But you don't actually know what effect they had, for example, on the bureaucrats that ran them, on the citizens that took place on them, and what small ripple. Granted, they didn't have the effects that the organizers hoped, which was that the media would immediate, immediately notice them. Everybody would say, oh my god, those citizens are so smart, I'm going to change my mind, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't have that kind of effect, but we can't say that they had no effect. And that our problem as political scientists is not being able to measure effect. Mark Warren. Yes, well, um, <clears throat> thank you for this um, great uh, talk. And uh, I just want to uh, ask or maybe comment on one 
bit that we've been talking about, and uh, I think there's a little bit of progress over the last time we tried to wrestle with this. And this is this question of system boundary, yes. uh, which is uh, especially yes. troubling. I brought that out, yeah. Yes, and um, you a said a couple of things that, collective co -authorship. That, that I thought were quite interesting. Um, one of them was that we probably need to think through the boundary question together with the democracy question, if I was hearing this correctly. That is the, uh, the inclusion question. Think through the boundary question. question along with the democracy question, yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, you then talked about that in terms of um, shared common fate, uh, which uh, moves us away from territorial boundaries and all sorts of other boundaries and makes it look as if uh, boundaries can be sort of serially um, uh, produced according to the kind of faith that is being shared, which means the kind of issue that is, uh, you know, on the table, uh, which begins to look a lot like <coughs> the um, uh, all affected yeah. principle right. <laughs> that um, uh, boundaries uh, are uh, or ought to be determined by the people who are potentially affected by a particular issue. And I guess the question is, uh, is that where you're going? I mean, is that the way that we think through this boundary question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, great question, Mark. And, and actually, um, I, I had a whole ton on that that I, that I cut from this talk. Um, because I think that uh, shared common fate does, of course, uh, lead you into all affected interests. And it gets into a, it allows you to sharpen the discussion. Um, and I, I, I had that a, lot, um, a, a group of standards that, sort of old standards and expanded standards, and I put into it old standards that the people who um, ought to be in the deciding system are those who are affected by the binding uh, qualities of a decision by the state that will be um, enforced by state uh, viol monopoly of violence. Um, that is a, a standard boundary to the, de the democratic decision of the state. And um, the introduction, as you know, since you've written about it, of the all affected interest principle destabilizes that, uh, but in ways that not everybody would agree with. So this is a highly contested uh, issue of what these uh, boundaries ought, ought to be. Um, and it involves this entire literature on all affected interests. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm a bit more of a fan of the of the polity boundary than, than most people because I see a, a large uh, loss in just sort of all affected interests. Um, but from the point of view of a deliberative system, um, the all affected interest principle makes a lot more sense. Uh, and we should be thinking of systems within systems. So there are systems that are, that are uh, those who have the right, so to speak, to affect um, a binding decision. Um, uh, uh, because they are going to be, uh, they, are go they are subject to those laws directly, and others who have a, a more indirect um, interest. But let me now broaden it even further. The trouble with um, common fate is that um, it disenfranchises, so to speak, those who only have deep concerns. So that, for example, in the genital cutting issue, the some of the deliberants were the people who had children who, were, who might or might not be cut. The children themselves were not part of the deliberation. Um, but a lot of the people who were deliberating were outside that system, the foundations, the NGOs who set the whole thing up, and so forth. And they, they had been processing these issues as well. They were processing them with the the people who were going to deciding whether or not to cut their children, but they were also processing them elsewhere. A common fate, unless you ex extend the concept of common fate so broadly as to make it almost have no, no meaning, would exclude from the del deliberative system anybody but the people who, and indeed perhaps only the people who are going to be cut. Um, and so I, I wanted not to use fate, but common concern, which was Simone's, uh, Simone Chambers's uh, formulation. So that's why I use that. Okay. Terry. Bernard Reber, CNRS, Centre de Recherche, uh, meaning, uh, Research Centre, Meaning Ethics and Society in Paris, five here in Paris. Uh, a theoretical question on your third part, uh, second function, ethics. 
uh, linked with the long history of deliberation field of research mentioned by Bernard Manin in the beginning. Uh, do you make any, uh, are, you, are, you, are you ready to go beyond the equal respect goal? Do you make any difference between moral deliberation and political one? And how do you live with the question of epistemic abstinence in the name of mutual respect? Is it respectful to hit your ethical position in a collective and pluralist deliberation? Okay. By, by epistemic abstinence, do you mean saying nothing? Is that, is that uh, what you yeah. say, Saying, you don't uh, say what you think on a moral point of view to respect the others. Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, yes, so, so, um, yeah. So th this is both a prudential, qu uh, this is both an ends means question in regard to the epistemic deliberation itself and it's an ethical question. Let me just quickly dispose of the prudential or, or ends means question, um, which is, you know, no matter how old you are in this room, you've had a lifetime of trying to figure out when it's best to talk and when it's best not to talk. And sometimes you can um, advance the epistemic uh, enterprise by keeping quiet. Um, so that's pr prudential. From the point of view of equal respect, it's also, um, uh, I think, um, a very uh, subtle matter of what is what evidence is genuine respect. Um, if I'm in a higher status, sometimes being quiet will 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 um, evince mutual respect, will respect my respect for the other, and will create a situation of mutual respect. On the other hand, you can imagine a, a very subtle change in the environment when my, my silence would be interpreted as non-engagement and therefore a way of uh, contempt. So, um, so the sort of simple binary of, of, of speak, no speak um, has to be filtered through our entire lo life worth <laughs> of um, social understandings as to the meaning of, of any given and um, uh, any given piece of speech or not speech. Uh, merci, uh, merci, Jen Menzruij, merci à tous les intervenants.